psychologist who's been working in Southern California for 25 years. Um, I got a bachelor's and master's degree in biological science from Cal State University Fullerton. And today I prepared a two-part lecture for you that includes the first part, which covers environmental laws relative to biological resources that govern what happens in California. And the second part of the lecture is how those laws translate into what I do as a consulting wildlife biologist. So I like to include you know, as part of my talk that every once in a while we get to see some really cool stuff. And I like to make this interactive. So of course, you guys should actually know what this is. It's a? Tortoise. It's a turtle. So we actually call them desert tortoises here. There is a slight difference between turtles and tortoises. I grew up calling them turtles, but now I call them desert tortoises because I like to think that I know what I'm talking about when I'm with others. So this is a desert tortoise, a federally threatened species that occurs all around the desert. Okay, the regulatory framework. So there are a lot of laws nationally and in California that relate to biological resources in California. And we're going to cover a few of them. Some of the federal laws include the National Environmental Policy Act, the Federal Endangered Species Act, uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which deals with migratory birds, and the Clean Water Act, which governs all impacts and projects associated with waterways. For state laws, it includes the California Environmental Quality Act, which is very similar to the National Environmental Policy Act. We have the State Endangered Species Act, the State Fish and Game Code. We have the Porter Cologne Act, which is very similar to the Clean Water Act, but for state waters. And finally, we have the Coastal, the California Coastal Act, which is run by the Coastal Commission for any developments or projects that go in along the coast. I'm going to be focusing on the top two up here, the National Environmental Policy Act and the Federal Endangered Species Act, and the California Environmental Quality Act and the State Endangered Species Act. So there's way too much material to cover all in one lecture. I'm just going to be focusing on the top two in each category. Okay, so what is the National Environmental Policy Act? It is an act that requires all federal agencies to incorporate environmental decisions into the planning process and decision-making process using a systematic interdisciplinary approach. So that means that every project that comes up that has federal impacts has to be evaluated in a systematic way so that we can evaluate how those impacts are going to affect the environment and how they can be mitigated. This act applies to all federal projects across the United States. So anytime any project that involves any federal land or any federal agency anywhere in the United States occurs, this act is triggered and has to be identified. So what is a project? When I say project, I mean that there are lots of federal agencies out there and any time a permit or essentially any time a permit is given by an agency to allow a project to proceed, then that triggers, then that, that belongs to what we call a project. Um, and the whole idea is for public awareness and participation. So during the National Environmental Policy Act process, all of the impacts associated with the project are identified and they're sent out to the public and they're sent out to different agencies so that they can be reviewed. And it gives the public the opportunity to uh, respond and give their concerns about that project so that they can be incorporated and listened to and taken into account during the project uh, process. Okay, so there's several different types of NEPA documents. That's the National Environmental Policy Act. The most simple project doesn't need a lot of environmental analysis. So we have what we call a categorical exclusion for the most simple projects. Moving up in a hierarchical fashion to more and more complex projects, we have what we call an environmental assessment, or EA. And an environmental assessment is a document that's produced for relatively small projects with very minor impacts to the environment. Or if there are significant impacts to the environment, they can be reduced to a level of less than significant um, through mitigation that we identify and, and incorporate into the project. So if, if a relatively simple project comes up and we prepare it and environmental assessment, then a bonsai or a finding of no significant impacts is prepared and the project is allowed to proceed. 
So moving up on the scale of, of complexity, the most complex project of all of them was going to involve pre preparation of an environmental uh, impact statement, or EIS. And these are big, massive projects that have impacts on the environment that include you know, biology and archaeology and air quality and numerous facets that have to be incorporated and identified during the project so that they can be identified and minimized to the extent possible. So these are the biggest projects, the most complex projects, and they're going to always have an environmental impact statement associated with them. At the end of this process, the, app, the, the agency usually prepares what we call a record of decision, and the record of decision identifies the project and identifies that it's been okayed, and the project is allowed to proceed. Okay, and every once in a while we get to see some cool stuff out there. I'm a biologist, I spend a lot of time in the field, and this happens to be an endangered plant that is a total of one inch tall. It occurs out here in the desert in this area. Uh, it's called the Mojave monkey flower. In 25 years of doing this, I've only seen this one plant one time, and this was the one plant that I saw. So uh, this is the Mojave monkey flower. Okay, so that was a very brief overview of the National Environmental Policy Act that involves all projects associated with, federal, with any type of federal permit. Now we're going to talk specifically about the California Environmental Quality Act, and, or CEQA. And CEQA um, results in a public disclosure document that is designed to inform decision makers of the impacts that would occur if they were to okay the project. So it's very similar to NEPA. The whole idea is to collect the information and to give it to the people who are going to make the decision about whether the project should be allowed to go so that they are making an informed decision. All of the information that's collected by all the different disciplines during a project are accumulated into a single document and they're sent to them and they can evaluate what the impacts are and how they're going to be mitigated and what's going to happen to the environment as a result of the project. This applies to all projects in the state. So throughout the state of California, anytime there's a project where there is a lead agency that is going to approve the project in some fashion, they have to go through some level of CEQA. I do want to point out that not all states have an equivalent to our CEQA law. So some states have an equivalent CEQA law, some states don't. In states that don't have a CEQA law, they don't have to go through this process at all. But as I mentioned, if they're in an, another state that doesn't have this law and it involves a federal agency, then they do have to go through NEPA. Um, I brought a sample document. Some projects are not very complex. Some projects are, but this is a CEQA document for a single project that involves a development um, up near New Hall Ranch. And this is just a summary of all of the interdisciplinary reports that were generated. So, there is an appendix with that with all of the reports for all the different disciplines that are evaluated that's probably at least twice that size. So there's a lot of information that's done by environmental consulting companies that go into um, specific reports that are then summarized in these documents for, for the lead agencies to review. Okay, so we talked about the environment. So what is the environment? This is impossible for you all to see, I understand that, but essentially, you know, biological resources is just one small facet of what, we're envi what we evaluate in an environmental impact report. Uh, there's air quality, there's water quality, there's traffic, there's aesthetics, there's, uh, you know, there's housing, there's traffic. What's going to happen when you build a thousand homes up there and all of a sudden all these people are going back and forth on my street all day? And what happens to... You know, that section of the desert that I've looked at out over my house for the last 20 years, that beautiful landscape that I've seen where now you're going to build five square miles of mirrors for a solar plant. So it's not just biological resources that are evaluated in these projects. There's a whole myriad of disciplines that have to be um, analyzed. And that's what, that's what I mean when I say it's an interdisciplinary um, approach to to evaluating these projects. It's not just biology. There are numerous things that have to be taken into account. OK, so types of CEQA documents. Remember the categorical, categorical exclusion for NEPA. Uh, we have a similar document um, called an initial study under CEQA. And again, these are all tiered documents. And they're hierarchical in that they are increasingly complex. So both of these laws are very similar. 
Um, we have an initial study, which is just a basic project, and essentially it's a checklist. Is it going to do this? Yes or no? Is it going to do this? Is it going to have a significant impact on this? And it's a checklist, and you go down it. And if there's no significant impacts on the entire project, then we can just prepare a negative declaration that says there's not going to be any impacts associated with this project, and we're going to allow it to go. And the elite agency approves the project. There can be a mitigated negative declaration, which means there might be some significant impacts associated with the project, but we are going to be able to reduce all those significant impacts to a level of less than significant by incorporating mitigation into the project. So this mitigated negative declaration is very similar to the uh, environmental assessment document for NEPA. And then the most complex, of course, is the environmental impact report, and I just showed you one of those, and it is normally for large complex projects where there's going to be a variety of significant impacts associated with it, and many times um, significant impacts cannot be reduced to a level of less, less than significant, so there's going to remain significant impacts even after the project is approved. And if that's the case, then we, we can prepare, or the lead agency will prepare, what we call a statement of overriding considerations, which means that they acknowledge that there's going to be significant impacts associated with this project, but the project is too important um, to the community or to the region, and we're going to allow it to proceed. Okay. So this is actually the checklist that I just talked to you about for the initial study, and it includes several different disciplines, and under biological resources, it just kind of says, is it going to have substantial adverse effects on populations of endangered species? Is it going to affect wildlife corridor movement between different locations? Is it going to affect um, streams or waterways in a way that affects uh, fisheries and wildlife movement along that? Um, is it going to affect regional conservation areas or habitat conservation plans or um, reserves that are already in place? So we go through this checklist, and if there's no impact on any of them, an initial study can be prepared, and the project moves along. But if they're all significant impacts, and these are minimum, you know, less, less than significant or significant but can be mitigated, and this column is potentially significant without mitigation. So this, they just go through this checklist for all these different disciplines, and this is the first step of the CEQA process. And every once in a while, we get to see some cool stuff. So this animal, hopefully you all recognize as a squirrel, and this happens to be the Mojave ground squirrel, which is a federally threatened or a state-threatened state animal that occurs in the Mojave Desert around... Uh, north of Victorville and around Barstow and from there to the north. So I was doing a tour of survey several years ago and came across a small population of uh, Mojave ground squirrels and there's one of those. And now we're going to move on to the actual Federal Endangered and State Endangered Species Act. So now we've already talked about the laws that govern projects on a, on a large scale, but now we're specifically going to talk about the Federal and State Endangered Species Act and how those work. Okay, so the Federal Endangered Species Act obviously protects species that are endangered of going extinct. That's the whole idea, is to protect species so that we can identify the problems and get them to the point where we can delist them or conserve them in a way that um, they can move forward and survive forever. It allows protection of both threatened and endangered animals. So I, I, I state that explicitly because many people just hear of endangered species, endangered species, endangered species, but that squirrel, for example, and the desert tortoise are both federally listed as threatened, not endangered. So it provides protections for both. So you might ask, what's the difference? Well, here's the difference. So an endangered species is any species which is likely uh, or is in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. So it's ready to go extinct throughout all or a significant portion of its range right now. It's on the blink of extinction. A threatened species, on the other hand, is any species, species which is likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. So we've identified species that if we don't start to do something now, in the near future, they're going to become endangered. So we have two levels of, of threat for all the species that are listed. Um, endangered species might go right now. And threatened species might go in the future if we don't start to, to address them. 
Okay, so the Federal Endangered Species Act is broken down into sections. You might hear section this and this and section that and that of the vehicle code or the fish and game code or the Endangered Species Act. And essentially it's just chapters. It's nothing fancy. They just call them sections instead of chapters. Um, and here's kind of the meat of the Federal Endangered Species Act is in section nine where it says that it is illegal to take an endangered species. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard that term, but it's used quite a bit, um, obviously, in what I do or with fish and game or fish and wildlife officials, and, or if you've ever seen a report where somebody was out you know, hunting illegally and they took something illegally, well, take is, is what it is illegal to do. And that is defined, and I'm gonna read this verbatim, it is take is defined as to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, collect, or to attempt to engage in any such activity. So that tells me they're pretty serious about their definition of pig, right? They want to make sure that they've got all their bases covered. They don't want somebody to go out there and say that they didn't know because it's not legal to do it. You can't even pursue an endangered species without it being considered take, all right? I also want to point out that under the Federal Endangered Species Act, harm, the word harm, is further to defined to include significant habitat modification of an endangered species such that it can significantly impair its essential behaviors that it needs um, to survive. So, what does that mean? If you can't impact its habitat, then, well, what it means, for example, is that if there's an endangered bird, like two that I work with that are migratory and they fly to South America or Central America for the winter, someone can say, well, they're not here, so I can't take an endangered species if they're in South America, so I'm going to mow down all this habitat right now because they're gone. But harm says you can't, you can't significantly impact um, endangered species habitat because when they come back, they're going to be gone. So, this, so by further defining harm to include significant habitat modification, they, they provide protection for endangered species even if they're not here at the time that it's back. Okay, so there are also sections 7 and 10 that allow projects to go forward. So everyone thinks that the Endangered Species Act, that's a generalization. Some people think that the Endangered Species Act is just out there to stop projects and it's used all the time to stop projects because they're sued, because they're not addressing, because they're resulting in take of an endangered species. But under the Federal Endangered Species Act, these two sections of law allow a project to go forward even though it may result in take of an endangered species as long as they do take appropriate actions to minimize or avoid those impacts to the extent possible, okay? So they can issue, the Fish and Wildlife Service can issue a permit that allows take under Section 7 and Sector 10 of the, under the Endangered Species Act. So, again, take of an endangered species may be authorized by the Fish and Wildlife Service under these two sections. The purpose of the Endangered Species Act is not to stop projects, it's to conserve species so that they don't go extinct. Um, section 7 of the Act is the section that allows federal agencies to go on with projects that might affect a desert tortoise. So BLM out here in the desert, which manages a lot of land, or the U.S. Forest Service, which, allow, which covers a lot of forested areas, can do projects that might affect the tortoise or the spotted owl or other projects um, under Section 7. Of course, a lot of projects that are done are private projects, private developments, or, you know, utility company projects um, that might go through endangered species habitat and under section 10 of the act the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service can provide a permit for that. And by the way section 10 is also the section that would issue a permit to someone like me to work with endangered species. So I am allowed to go out and search, pursue, not hunt, but I, I do pursue endangered species quite a bit in, the, in, in my normal you know day-to-day -day job activities and under section 10 I have permits to work with certain endangered species. Okay, so everyone knows that things get listed under the Act, but under Section 4 of the Act, it outlines the process by which species can also be delisted. The whole purpose of the Act is identify animals that might, and plants, that might become endangered or become extinct and to find ways to incorporate things into what's going on in the environment such that they can be conserved and they can be delisted so that they're, uh, you know, to the point where they're not endangered anymore. Uh, lastly, 
protections of plants versus animals. Plants actually can be listed under the Endangered Species Act, but plants aren't protected on, on, private, pro on private projects. So if there's an endangered animal on a project, you have to address it under the Endangered Species Act. If there's an endangered plant on a project, it doesn't have to be addressed on private projects because people essentially own their own land. Wildlife can move to, to your land and to other people's land, but private land is private land, and if there's a plant on it, you can actually impact that, that plant after you send a letter to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that says, hey, I have an endangered plant on my land. I want to you know, start farming alfalfa here. I'm going to mow it, and you would be allowed to do that. Now, if it's a federal project and there's an endangered plant, the federal agencies do have to address endangered plant issues, but private projects don't, so there is a distinction there. Okay, so that's the Federal Endangered Species Act. And every once in a while, I get to see some pretty cool stuff. So this is a, a burrowing owl. Uh, we do a lot of surveys for this. It's protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and Fish and Game Code, and it's not listed as threatened and endangered, but it's a really cool animal. And if you spend any time in the desert, you've probably seen these. Okay, so what's the differences between the Federal Endangered Species Act and the California Endangered Species Act? So here's the Endangered Species Act. Again, it protects species that are endangered of going extinct. <clears throat> it allows protection for species listed as threatened and endangered, so it's very similar to the other one. An endangered species, the definition is slightly different. It's a species that is a native species or subspecies of bird, mammal, fish, amphibian, reptile, or plant which is in serious danger of becoming extinct. So the definition is slightly different. This one lists the types of animals and plants that are listed, and one that's missing on this that is included in the Federal Endangered Species Act is insects. So there can be no insects listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. There's lots of butterflies and flies and crickets and all kinds of stuff. Snails that are, that are all invertebrates that are listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act that can't be listed under the State Endangered Species Act. A threatened species is a native species or subspecies of bird, mammal, fish, amphibian, reptile, or plant, although not presently threatened with extinction, is likely to become extinct in the foreseeable future. So these laws are very similar in their definitions, but there are differences in the types of species that can be protected. Okay, under the California Endangered Species Act, it has sections or chapters of the law, and under section 86, it defines take to pursue, catch, capture, or kill, or attempt to hunt, pursue, capture, or kill. So it's a, a much smaller, not as broad definition as what um, we see in the Endangered Species Act. And the big difference is that we don't see the inclusion of the word harm for this, and you remember harm was further defined to protect or, or guard against um, habitat modification that might result in the death or take of an endangered species. Well, this doesn't include that. So under the State Endangered Species Act, as long as you are not killing an animal or, or doing something that results in direct take, like hunting, pursuing, catching, capturing, or killing an animal, you're okay in terms of take under the California Endangered Species Act. Like the Federal Endangered Species Act, under Section 2081, it allows take of threatened and endangered, and endangered species. So remember, under the Federal Endangered Species Act, we have Section 7 and Section 10, which allow federal and private projects to, um, allows them to take those endangered species. We have a very similar section under the State Endangered Species Act to allow take of endangered species. Under Section 2080.1, we have a consistency determination, it's called, and it's all that means is that if there's something that's federally and state listed, and you've gone through the federal process to jump through numerous hoops to get your project approved and planned, and you've gone through all the lead agencies and Fish and Game and Fish and Wildlife and all those agencies, and you have all your permits, Fish and Game isn't going to make you get a separate permit to deal with that. They're just going to say, we understand that you've dealt with the provisions of the Federal Endangered Species Act. And because you're complying with the Federal Endangered Species Act, the acts are close enough that we're just going to give you a consistency determination and not make you do anything else, essentially. Okay? All right. And every once in a while, I get to see some cool stuff. This is a gecko. They're really common in the desert. If you ever go riding on a remote road in the desert at all, you'll see these crossing the roads all the time. This is the western banded gecko, Coleonyx variegatus. Uh, 
which you might see all the time out here if you if you get away from the city a little bit on a on a on a dirt road or a or a remote asphalt road. <coughs> okay, so that wraps up actually the first part of the lecture where I cover environmental laws um, that govern what I do as a wildlife biologist. Should I continue on, or what do you want to um, do here? I think it would be a good time to to take a couple of questions. Let's open it up to uh, Granite Hills first. Do you have any questions from Granite Hills at all? Why don't you ask him how much he enjoys his job, if it's a cool <laughs> job? How about that? How much do you enjoy your job? <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was right on cue. Well, I'll tell you. I included slides uh, and pictures of animals and stuff that I encounter in the field because I actually do love what I do. Um, I'm not the type of person that's going to sit in an office my entire career and you know type at a typewriter and do accounting. I have to do because I work for myself and and whatever else it takes. Um, my profession is ideal for me because it allows me the opportunity to get outside. Um, I'm an active bird watcher. I've, I've hiked the John Muir Trail. I've backpacked my whole life. I fish. You know, I, I, yeah, I like to get outside. And, and this job actually, in some, you know, I tell people I get paid to bird watch. And not a lot of people can say that. I, I have permits to work with uh, three endangered birds that occur in Southern California. And when I'm not birding on the weekends for fun, I'm birding during the week getting paid for it. So. Um, if you like to be outside, if you like the outdoors, if you don't want to be stuck in the office all the time, uh, then this might be a good job for you. I, 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 I enjoy it quite a bit, actually. And that's nope. actually the whole purpose uh, for me, including these slides. Okay, how about uh, AE? Do you guys have, have uh, a question? Or two? Any questions, guys? All right, I've got a question for you guys. Repeat after me. <laughs> how easy is it to get internships and volunteer opportunities to get a taste of your job. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not your job. Thank you. <clears throat> there are companies out there that give internships. Um, a lot of internships are run through college programs where they have an internship program in the school and you can go in and there might be there might be environmental consulting companies that offer internships. <coughs> For me personally, um, I run certain projects that we, that where I do bird trapping during the spring and I have traps all over the place and because I can't check all the traps myself every single day that they require to be checked, I actually do hire um, part-time employees usually in the spring to help me check those traps. I don't run it as an internship program um, because some universities don't offer it and there's a lot of red tape frankly and I want to make sure that I'm covered legally so I actually hire, go through the hiring process where you become an actual employee and you're covered under my insurance and you're you know paid with a check and it's not under the table so for, for me myself I, I hire college students um, I'll go out to local universities, including Lynn's class in the past, and given a brief introduction to what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and why I need the help and what would be required of the students um, during that process. But um, that's a very different thing than internship programs. So if you are interested in doing it, there, there are internship programs you can go to, you know, I don't, I don't know what section of the university would have that, but there are certainly internship programs. There are big company. I'm a very small company. I work with, for myself. <coughs> and I have employees. We hire employees. But big environmental consulting companies certainly have um, the opportunity to get work experience through an internship program at school. Yeah. If I, I'll just add to that a little bit from the record, it, you know, we see all these really cool jobs that uh, doing on National Geographic and some of these things. It just astounds me that folks with a little bit of background um, can go, especially with, with uh, university researchers and internships, like Brian said, and you can work on some really, really cool, cool projects studying some of these things. And it just takes mostly a little bit of initiative, but you've also got to get some training because they need you to have 
some kind of thing to bring to the table generally. What, what we use a lot is geographic information systems. If you can work geographic information systems, that can often help the researcher and or the consultant because that's not maybe a skill that they have or that they have time to do. So um, it's just amazing how you can go out and actually have opportunity to do these really cool jobs. And there's a lot of this work going on, correct, Brian? There is. There is a lot of this work. And um, speaking for myself, when I was in school, I, I met a major professor who had grants of $100,000 to study two lizards. And I had no idea what I was going to do. I was majoring in biology, and I'm a senior. And I was like, well, I'm not going to get a PhD, and I'm not smart enough to be a doctor. What, what am I going to do you know, with a degree in biology? So I was fortunate enough to meet a major professor who had a massive grant to study these two lizards. So for two whole years, um, I spent my summers running through the hills of Southern California, Orange, and San Diego counties look, looking for these two lizards and taking a bunch of habitat data whenever I found them um, to develop a habitat quality index for these two, liz for these two lizards. And eventually, all this information was written up in these massive reports that were sent to Fish and Game to help them evaluate whether or not they should be listed as threatened or endangered. So I would encourage you, you know, once you get to school and you pick your major, um, not to just go through the motion of taking class, 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 and not developing relationships with your major professors. Get to know them. Get interested in what they're doing. And opportunities will show themselves to you. And it, and it will, if nothing else, if you don't like it, you'll learn that you don't like it. But if you never try it, then you don't know if you like it or not. Like I said, I had no idea what I was going to do with my degree uh, when I was a senior. And all of a sudden, I was like, wow, there's, I'm getting paid to chase lizards. What else is there? <laughs> the next thing I knew, I was getting paid to chase tortoises, doing massive desert tortoise projects. And the next thing I knew, and so all of a sudden, a career evolved out of me just having a relationship with a major professor that turned into something more. Yeah, and I just mentioned again, uh, specifically AAE students, you guys have got some amazing opportunities that have already happened out there. You've got a refugio for the Mojave Chewy Chub right on your campus that Mr. Huffine has uh, done a lot of work on. So, and you've got that really cool riparian area right there on your campus where some major projects are going on. That I mentioned to you yesterday the Resource Conservation District that I volunteer with. We've got a huge invasive weed, tamarisk, salt cedar project there. And there's work around that. Lynn Shirley has done some work, and students from BBC have been going down there and working on another invasive weed called pepperweed. So um, there's tons of opportunities. You just have to be available. And these are the things that on your resume, and don't think that this has to, you have to be a PhD student to do this. High school students, this is the stuff that when you're doing what I call real science in the, in the biological environmental field, this is the real thing. And that's the stuff that goes on your resume. And that's the stuff that will get you into the top programs. That's the stuff that will get you a job. Saying that you've taken X number of classes and have a certificate is going to be helpful. But this opportunity to do real science not only will give you the purpose, but it, it's the stuff that employers are looking for on your resume. Can you actually do something with your education? Would you concur with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. OK, so any other questions? Any questions from uh, BBC side? <coughs> I actually had one actually extra out of plan. But like the Joshua tree, you yeah. said people who have private land, they can take out the plants, mm -hmm. but um, do they have to know by someone first, or how, do, I mean, what's... Yeah, it? so her question was about the Federal Endangered Species Act and, and not having to address endangered plants on a private property. So there is a notification process. So you can't just ignore that they're there. You, you have to write up... Um, normally, anytime there's a project, there's going to be a biological report associated with it. So someone like me would go out and evaluate the property and say there's this and there's this and there's this and there's no habitat for this endangered bird and there's no habitat for the tortoise. But we did find over in the corner of this property a small population of endangered plants. And if there's a federal involvement, where, like if there's BLM land associated with it or an ingress or you need a permit to go through BLM property, then that automatically means that it has to be addressed because there's a federal nexus. But if there's no federal nexus, it's all private. 
and you have a property, there's a notification process to the agencies that you have an endangered plant on your property that you want to take out and use it. Yeah. Uh, However, yeah. is that, that's the Federal Endangered Species Act. In California, we also have the California Environmental Quality Act. And under that same project, under the California Environmental Quality Act, there is no such um, way to get out of dealing with an endangered plant. So that checklist says, will it affect an endangered plant or, or animal? And if, and if the answer is yes, then that's going to be a significant impact. And um, the impacts to that endangered plant population would have to be addressed and mitigated and minimized under, under the California Environmental Quality Act even though you wouldn't have to do anything under the Federal Endangered Species Act. So there is some um, protection allowed by the other law. I have one more question, actually. The squirrel, the endangered one, uh -huh. how difficult is it to tell the regular um, Okay, so her question was, <laughs> is it easy to identify that squirrel from the other squirrels that are out here? There's a couple other squirrels. One is the California ground squirrel, which is everywhere. It's probably on this campus, and it digs under rocks. And it, and it creates havoc, and it's kind of a pest. And it has a really, it's light, and has a long, bushy tail, and it's always scurrying around the ground. And so that's the California ground squirrel. It's very easy to identify from that one. There's another squirrel called the round tail squirrel, and that occurs out here as well, mostly in sandy situations. And um, that round tailed ground squirrel is actually very similar to this. And it's very difficult to identify and tell apart. Uh, the difference primarily visually is that the round-tailed ground squirrel has a very long tail, about five to six inches, about, about the, the, the width of a pencil, whereas the Mojave ground squirrel has a fairly small tail that's only three to four inches. Um, but that's very difficult to see in the field, and there's always variation in every species, right? We know that from Darwin. So there could be a very short-tailed, long, you know, round-tailed ground squirrel, and there could be a very long-tailed, Mojave ground squirrel, very difficult to identify and tell apart. I will also say that uh, Mojave ground squirrels are usually in very remote areas. They're very secretive, they're very shy, and they're usually gonna be gone long before you get into an area where they occur. Whereas the other ones, um, let's see, the round-tailed ground squirrel you can see like in Barstow, I forget the road that goes up, over by the train station, you get the other side of the Mojave River and there's just sand everywhere, they're all over around there. So, the, so they're more common, and, and they're easy to find. So if you're in a remote area, and there's a small squirrel with a short tail, you have that one. Otherwise, it's probably not it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so that, that question was from my wife. And so what she, oh, how did that happen? Little Camera picture. fall. Okay. <laughs> so I figured she was going to ask the other question about, um, we had a situation that I was sitting here thinking I need to clear my heart, my conscience, mm. because we had a situation a few years ago when we were doing this class to Lucerne Valley High School and experimenting with this exact same technology, and one of the students found some owls, chicks, in, in alfalfa, in the bales of alfalfa, and, and they couldn't take care of them, so I agreed to take care of them, and I thought for the longest time they were barn owls. And I just wasn't paying attention because they're very different. And they were actually ground burrowing uh, um, <clears throat> owls. And so when we discovered that they were brown owls, when they got, I mean, burrowing owls, when they got a little bigger because they're, they're very small, then we actually did let them go. But I was actually in federal uh, violation of, of, a, <laughs> of a threatened species or California. Uh -huh. uh, take at that point, correct, Brian? Well, um, so the burrowing owl is not currently listed as okay. threatened or endangered under okay. the federal or the state endangered species act. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they are a raptor, right. which is a bird of prey, so it includes all hawks and owls. And there's a specific section of the California Department of Fish and Game Code, which I really didn't talk about much. Um, but under the California Department of Fish and Game Code, it's illegal to take or to have in possession any raptor or its or its nest, or its eggs, or its feathers, even. Mm -hmm. So, so under the under the California Department of Fish and Game Code, you can't have a raptor, or a nest, or an egg, or a feather. And under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which almost all birds are included, um, you can't you can't handle or have raptors or or the animal either. So, state or the state and federal Endangered Species Act are 
and not violated there. Here, probably the other ones, but I think in most cases in a situation like that, fishing game isn't going to come down and arrest you because you, you know, you rescued Al. You know, you, you brought it up and you know how it was and you it, and I think that you should be. Thank you. And hopefully my wife will get off my case. So. Yes? Was it considered a big project? Is just like big developments in areas that are very remote or just like if I want to um, build a house in a remote area, just a, a house, would that be considered a project that has to go through the process? Okay. So her, her question was how big projects are obvious, but what's like, the, the small project? Yeah. So on a private land development, <clears throat> excuse me, let's say in San Bernardino County, remote area, you, you have to grade your land to build a house. And to grade your land, you have to get a grading permit from that county. Because you have to get a county permit, to grade your land, that triggers CEQA. Okay. So, so it's a project. Yeah. On a project like that, that's that small, that you, you might get, ta or you might have to do a categorical exclusion, that one that says essentially, oh, it's a very small project, there's no impacts, you're gonna be okay. Yeah. They're gonna go through that checklist. Is it gonna affect this, or this, or this, or this, and they're gonna say no. So the county would be responsible for preparing that CEQA document, and it might be as simple as um, doing a categorical exclusion. If you have a private property and you want to build your house and you want to grade 100 acres for an alfalfa field and you're in the middle of the desert and there might be desert tortoises, a biologist would go out and evaluate the property and say, there's lots of tortoise habitat here. Taking this habitat might result in the take of a desert tortoise. So in, on that checklist, we're gonna check it could potentially affect an endangered species and that's gonna trigger a, a, a mitigated negative declaration probably. So there's gonna be impacts to a, a desert tortoise. It's going to trigger the Federal Endangered Species Act. You'll have to get permits from Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, if you happen to impact a stream that goes through your property to build that, or you're going to dig a well next to a stream, then you're going to have to get your fish and game permit because you're impacting a stream bed. Um, and then you'll go through the CEQA process, the Federal Endangered Species Act process, and all that. And this is a small developer or a small private person that just wants to grow their own alfalfa. So it, it just depends on where you are. There, there's lots of projects out there um, on fallow agricultural lands. So if you bought 100 acres and you wanted to build your house and there's already, you know, you would still need to get a grading permit from the county. But if, if the land is already at fallow agricultural land and there's no tortoise habitat or anything, that you wouldn't have to go through those. <coughs> there would still be an analysis um, by a biologist to evaluate the potential presence of threatened and endangered species on the property that you would probably have <coughs> the county so that they can do that checklist um, in a knowledgeable way. They're not, they don't usually guess, so I don't know, but <laughs> they say no. So um, one of our jobs is to go out and initial assessment of a property to identify what might be there. Um, and then as the project moves forward, uh, we'll identify um, whether or not they actually are there by doing focus surveys, which is what we'll talk about next. How about in uh, rivers like that goes through different states? As long as it's, it comes through California, then it would go into the CEQA part? Um, she she asked about rivers and going through multiple states. So it depends on it depends on the project. But under the clean the federal Clean Water Act, it, it, it deals with with federal waters and interstate waters, okay. and so so if you're gonna you know build a bridge or rebuild the, the, the banks of a stream through your property because you don't want it flooding, then you're going to have to get a, a, a 404 permit from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to impact the drainage. That's a federal project. That's federal. And then the state, California Fishing Game Code, it includes a section, section 1600 that deals with stream beds. And you would have to get a stream bed alteration agreement under the state laws to do the same project. So you need a federal and a state project. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks very much, Brian. We'll, we'll just, if it's okay with you, do you need a break or we'll just move on to the, the next, keep going? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to just keep moving. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm ready to go. Cool. So, uh, looks like we, we already lost granite, so that's perfect. So, A, we're gonna keep going, and then this part of it will be captured under a uh, under a different video that will hopefully within the next week or so be put up on blackboard so Brian I'm just going to stop it right now okay